Well, hopefully you guys are logged on and able to join us for tonight's Wednesday study. Um, if you have your Bible and you want to open to 1 Peter chapter 1, that's where we're going to be. I know I really enjoyed uh, Sunday morning and last Wednesday um, joining via Facebook and fellowshipping with everyone. Even though we're not in this building, you know, obviously the church is not this building. We're the church, Jesus living in us. And so it was cool to be able to gather with my family and fellowship around the word uh, over the internet. Pretty cool that we have that technology available for us. So I hope you guys have your Bibles open to First Peter. And um, <clears throat> I understand some people may be in their pajamas and whatnot. That's okay, I suppose. Uh, seeing how it is the evening. But I was reminded this week, uh, Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, um, he said, when you fast, anoint your head with oil. You know, when, when, you, when you do that, when you choose to do that, don't make it so obvious that everyone knows you're fasting. You know, like the Pharisees would put dirt on their heads and, you know, wear torn clothes and whatnot. Well, similar to that, I would suggest... Um, if you're staying inside all day and whatnot, you know, if you're a man, change out of your pajamas. Don't wear your pajamas all day long. You know, be ready. I think, I think Jesus would expect that. Uh, don't read into it. I'm not saying you're messing up too bad if you're staying in your PJs. All I'm saying is Mainers don't need more excuses to wear their pajamas out of the house. You guys know what I mean. Uh, that's a joke. All right, First Peter chapter 1, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this night. God, thank you for giving us your word. Father, I pray that now as we come before you, that you would speak to us. Lord, we know that you have things uh, for us in this time. And Lord, would you comfort our hearts or remind us of your promises and lead us closer to you. I pray for the families watching, Lord, that you would bless them that they'd be able to follow along, that they wouldn't have any technical difficulties, Lord, uh, getting everything up and running. And Lord, we pray for our pastor, Brian, that you would uh, bless him and his family. And Lord, that you would bless your word. In your name we pray, amen. So First Peter chapter 1. Uh, First Peter here, this epistle written to the churches, it has to do with um, enduring hardship, enduring suffering, uh, specifically persecution. But with that, there's obviously other hardships that can be associated with it. And in, in, in here, in this epistle, uh, Peter gives us some insight on how to endure difficult circumstances, which I know, obviously, many of us are concerned with the state of the nation and um, maybe financially jobs and just different things, not knowing um, what could potentially happen. And so I believe this is from the Lord uh, for us tonight. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at First Peter chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, in Cappadocia, Asia, in Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, speaking of Jesus' death on the cross, his blood that was shed for us. Um, you know, it's not, it's not saying that we physically need to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Uh, we understand that. It's symbolic. Verse 3. Oh, I'm sorry. He says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And really that's, that verse, verse 3, is going to be the majority of our text, or specifically living hope, that Jesus specifically is our living hope. And we're going we're gonna to talk about what hope is. Uh, Continuing on, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance 
incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, Peter says, you greatly rejoice. In this, he says, you greatly rejoice. In what? The hope, specifically the living hope that we have in Jesus. He says in verse 4, we have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade. And then in verse 6, he says, in this, you greatly rejoice. That is what Peter is encouraging us to rejoice in, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Um, Even though, he says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. The reality of our Christian life is we are going to endure trials. The difficult thing, though, is how, to, how do we remain hopeful in the midst of difficult trials? How, how do we continue to serve Jesus with our whole heart in the midst of, in context, persecution, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of difficulties? How is it that we can continue on? Well, Peter gives us the key. He says, rejoicing in the hope that's offered by Jesus Christ. Being reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. We have an inheritance, yet future, yet to come, in Christ. Uh, So often we can get our focus on the trial rather than focusing on um, the inheritance that, and the hope uh, that we have in Christ. And so 1 Peter, um, really dealing with enduring suffering, enduring hardship, uh, skipping ahead, says in... uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Um, some of you ladies can understand this hardship. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. That's kind of a joke, but it is, it is true. Uh, that can be something that wives have to endure, right? Being submissive to your own husbands. I know certainly my wife never has to endure any hardship there because I'm a great husband. Being sarcastic. Verse 7 says, husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Okay, there's some hardship that we can endure, right, husbands? So how do we dwell with them with understanding? Sometimes that's difficult. But again, First Peter, enduring hardship, understanding suffering. And there is suffering, there is hardship in both of those things. For a wife to be submissive to her husband, even though she knows he's a knucklehead. For the husband to dwell with understanding with the wife, that can be difficult sometimes. Uh, skipping down to verse 13. It says, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse 15, Peter gives us some more insight. So the first... The first insight or the first suggestion he gives us for enduring hardship would be to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, Second here in verse 15, he says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He tells us to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. What does it mean to sanctify the Lord in our hearts? What does it mean to sanctify something? Uh, To sanctify something literally means to make it set apart, um, cause it to be different. To sanctify Christ, to to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our hearts literally means give him first place in your life. Um, Paul says it in Colossians. He says, in all things that Christ would have the preeminence. That in all aspects of our life, in all areas of our life, that Jesus would, would have first place. And so how do we endure hardship? How do we get through difficult circumstances, difficult trials? Well, he says, first and foremost, you need to sanctify the Lord God in your heart. If Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, then enduring circumstances, enduring difficult times, I mean, there, there, there really is... He is our only hope. He is our living hope as Christians. And so as Christians, should should we be worrying or stressing out as we're enduring difficult times or going through difficult trials? No, we shouldn't. But first off, we need to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts to give him his rightful place. 
And when Jesus has his rightful place in our hearts, this is a result. Let's see what happens. So when you sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, he says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. When you sanctify the Lord Jesus in your heart, Peter goes on to say, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you, implying that when you sanctify the Lord in your heart, people are going to notice something different about you. And specifically what they're going to notice is the fact that you have hope. And he says, be ready to give a reason for that hope because the world is going to ask about that hope. And so when you sanctify Jesus in your heart, be ready to answer people's questions. Now, they may not ask you, you know, they may not come up to you and say, man, tell me about your hope. They may not phrase it that way, but they may come up to you in the midst of crazy circumstances and say, you know, why are you so happy today in light of everything that's going on? You know, or, man, how come you just always seem so joyful, you know, even though circumstances are so grim? Well, and, and then we need to be ready to give a reason for that hope. And my challenge to all of us in light of everything that's happening around us is, as Christians, and I'm speaking to the believers right now, as Christians, we have to ask ourselves, do we have hope for the world to see in light of our current circumstances? Or are we getting caught up in all the mayhem? Are we getting caught up in all of the uh, circumstances? I'm not saying that those circumstances aren't real. And there are real threats. And we do have to be aware and, and, do, and use wisdom and act accordingly. But there's a difference between, um, I guess, acting on something or being aware of something and uh, being cautious and just getting caught up in full-scale pandemonium and mayhem. Um, as Christians, if we're sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts, then it says here, when you do that, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. So we should have hope in our lives that the whole world can see. And um, don't be surprised when they ask you about this hope. Be ready to give an answer. You know, why are you so hopeful? Why are you so joyful during this time in our country and in this state? Financially, everything seems to be uh, coming undone or um, maybe whatever your worries are, I guess there's a list of them in light of our current circumstances. Um, I would challenge all of us as Christians, number one, sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and then be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. He says, with meekness and in fear, having a good conscience, and I, th I believe that's important too, as Christians, to know that, that we're called to have hope, we're called to... Um, be witnesses to people, and it's important to, to have a good conscience when we do that. So I guess what is the definition of hope? Anyone know? Oh, shout it out. Didn't hear you. You guys can talk about it. The definition of hope. Hope is a lot like faith. Hope is a lot like faith. Hope is ex expecting to receive good. Um, that's a decent definition of hope. Biblically, it goes a little beyond that. Um, it's, not, it's not hope is in the sense, uh, you know, I'm not sure this is going to happen, but I really hope it does. Uh, a biblical sense of hope is having 100% assurance of God's promises and knowing that they will happen eventually, that they will happen yet future. And so that hope motivates how we live. That hope is contagious. Other people can see that hope in us. So that's what hope is. Hope is expecting good to happen. Well, the opposite of hope would be fear. Um, and anyone can guess at a definition of fear? Fear is expecting bad to happen. So you can see, obviously, that's the opposite of hope. Hope would be expecting good to happen. Fear would be expecting bad to happen. On Sunday, Brian was teaching through John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, and he brought up a cool point. Um, I wrote it down. 
he brought up the fact that Jesus, in John chapter 1, it says Jesus came to bring light, and he came to bring life. Contrary to what this world has to offer, or the opposite of that, would be death and darkness. And Brian pointed out that death and darkness are natural fears of man, uh, being afraid of the dark, being afraid of death. But Jesus came to bring life, and he came to bring light. And just like those stand in contrast to each other, I believe hope and fear contrast each other. Uh, fear would be a natural tendency of man, and faith and worry contrast each other. So on one hand, you have hope and you have faith, things that we're called to have as Christians. But then uh, on the other hand, or the opposite of that would be um, fear and worry. And, and I would say that fear and worry would be our natural tendencies as humans um, to focus on our current circumstances and allow the worry to eat at us. And, and I guess the question would be, how can you have hope and not fear? What can you do? Well, light naturally gets rid of dark, you know, and hope naturally gets rid of fear, and faith naturally gets rid of worry. And so as Christians, how do we increase these things, or where do these things come from? Well, the answer was in our text, 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. When you put Jesus on the throne of your heart, hope is a natural result of that. And how do we know that? Well, it says in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. We have been born again, it says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How do we acquire hope as Christians? By looking to Jesus Christ. He is our hope. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Now that's a perfect example of looking to Jesus as our example. Jesus endured the cross. That was extremely difficult. That was an extreme hardship that he had to endure. How did he endure it? Well, it says, for the joy that was set before him. Was the cross joyous for Jesus to bear? No, there was, there was pain involved. There was hardship there. It says he despised the shame. He didn't enjoy th that act, but it was the joy that was set before him that he endured it. And if you will, the hope that was set before him. And what was that hope? That joy or that hope that was set before Jesus was knowing that he could have a relationship with us. And so what would be our joy? What would be our hope? You know, well, it's, it's just that. It's knowing that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ because we're told that he is our living hope. And we have, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade. And so hope is a big deal, and hope is contagious. And there's a lot of promises in God's word um, that imply or, or, or tell us that we have a lot of things to be hopeful for. Um, I'm sure you guys can think of some. Uh, one is found in Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 15. Nope, verse 13. Titus 2, 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as Christians, what's one of the things that we can hope for? It's the return of Christ, his appearing. Um, Colossians chapter 1, 4 through 5. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, heaven being something that we should hope for. First uh, Timothy 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. So, 
as Christians, our hope revolves around our right relationship with Jesus Christ. And it all starts by sanctifying the Lord in your heart. And so if you're lacking hope tonight or you're getting caught up in all the chaos in the world, I would challenge you, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. This isn't something that you do one time. You know, this is something that you will do on a daily basis. You constantly put the Lord, the Lord first. You seek him every day. You get in routines and, and you constantly have to make Jesus Lord of your heart. And here's why. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. And the thing with a living sacrifice is it constantly crawls off the altar. And so in order for us to put ourselves on the altar, that's something we have to do daily. We have to die to ourselves constantly so that Jesus can be sanctified in our hearts. And when we do that, be prepared to give a defense. Be prepared to give a reason to this lost world, this hopeless world, be prepared to give them a reason for the hope that is in you because that is going to be a natural result of you sanctifying the Lord in your own life is, is hope uh, because he is our living hope. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us some things regarding worry. As we discussed, um, fear is the enemy to hope. Worry is the enemy to faith. Uh, we are called as Christians to have faith, hope, and love. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, towards the end of the chapter. Um, it says these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So in Matthew chapter 6, um, Jesus tells us in verse 25, he says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry. It's not a suggestion. This is a commandment from Jesus. He says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry. And again, if you're worrying, then you're not practicing faith. It says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We want to be well-pleasing to the Lord. Um, and so worry being the opposite of faith. Jesus commands us, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I guess what would be some things that we're tempted to worry about? Um, what are some things in our own lives that we might be tempted to worry about? Uh, in verse 25, Jesus says, therefore. So he's drawing our attention to something that he previously said. In Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, so what's something that we could worry about? Well, our stuff. If we're, if we're storing up treasures in this life, if we're not sending our treasures ahead, it's, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with having cool things just as long as those things don't have you. Um, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, therefore, do not worry. And so is your focus storing up treasures on this earth? Because if it is, you're going to struggle with worry because that's where your focus is. And it says here, moth and rust will destroy it. And so that's going to be something you could be tempted to worry about. It says in verse 22, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Ultimately, what Jesus is saying is the lens of your eye, what you take in. What you, initially, what, what you take in then goes into your mind. And this goes to taking your thoughts captive and, and what's happening in your mind. Um, and so worry if, you're, if your lens, if your, your perspective is wrong, then that's going to cause worry in your life. Uh, and then he says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. Ultimately, you cannot serve two masters. That is a cause for worry. You know, if you have a divided heart, that's going to tear you apart. Um, and worry can become a master, a, 
a very cruel master. It's, it's interesting how that works. Some people worry about their health. And then in worrying about your health, that's bad for your health. It's, just, it's, it's crazy how that works. When Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry, I also want to point out, he's, he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to Christians. He's telling them not to worry. If you aren't saved, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this, you need to worry. You know, a- apart, from, apart from Christ, there are things you should be concerned about. In fact, apart from Christ, maybe many of us can testify, we worried about life after death. What was going to happen to us? And it was our worry that drove us to Christ. But once you establish a relationship with Jesus Christ, once you sanctify the Lord in your heart and you have this hope, there is no reason for us to worry. And that's what Jesus is going to describe here. He's going to give us reasons why we don't, as Christians, have to worry. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So why don't we need to worry as Christians? Because Jesus loves us. And when you think about this, what is our biggest need as, as humans? What, what is our biggest need that we need to have? How can, how do I word this? What is the most important thing to all of us humans? Whether, whether you think so or not, ultimately it's when you die, where are you going to go? Heaven or hell? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's the biggest question. That's the biggest need that us as humans that we have, a right relationship with our Lord and Savior. Now, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If Jesus met our biggest need to date— which is our salvation, and he did it at such a high cost, don't you think he can also take care of our small needs? When you put it in that perspective, it really, it, it, should, it should really take away our worry because why, and, and he's going to go on to say, um, what's, what's the point of worrying? It says in verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Worrying does nothing. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that worrying about a situation doesn't solve the situation? Worrying about your health doesn't solve your health. Worrying about what's happening and this and that, that doesn't change anything. Specifically, what Jesus is saying here, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? That word stature speaks of a length of time, not necessarily your height, but a length of time. Which, which, which of you by worrying can increase your days on the earth? You can't. In fact, worrying actually degrades your health, probably give you less life here on this earth. So, so why shouldn't we worry? Because Jesus loves us. Why, sh- why shouldn't we worry? Because it doesn't accomplish anything. He says in verse 29, Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into to the oven— Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And here's another reason why we shouldn't worry. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Worry is the opposite of faith. If you want to be pleasing to the Lord, you need to practice faith and not worry. Well, well, how can I get this under control? Anyone who is increasing in faith doesn't worry. But if you're worrying... You're not, you're not increasing in faith. They, they, they go against each other. So if you want to be pleasing to the Lord, don't worry. Worry ultimately is doubting the promises of God, doubting his goodness. Verse 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's the solution right there. But seek first the kingdom of God. And ultimately, that's what Peter was saying in 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Here, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Put Jesus on the throne. 
Allow him to have preeminence in your life. Allow him to have first place in, in every area. What might that look like for you? Well, on a practical level, seek first the kingdom of God. When you wake up in the morning, what are you seeking first? I'm not saying you can't have a cup of coffee first, uh, but, but are you seeking, am I, am I seeking uh, the kingdom of Rosaire first off in the morning? Or am I seeking the kingdom of God by getting into his word? Because oftentimes when you wake up in the morning, if, if, if the first thing you do is give into your flesh in the morning, then often that's going to set a habit for the rest of the day. But if you seek first, first off the kingdom of God, often you'll find that you'll be sanctifying the Lord in your heart all day because you sought first the kingdom of God. And when you do that, not only will you be blessed by your relationship with the Lord, but he says all these things that you're tempted to worry about, man, I'll throw them in. It will be added unto you. Don't, don't, even, don't even waste your time worrying about those things. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Now, for those of you who are like me and tempted to say, ah, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. I can worry about today. No, don't worry. He says he's already commanded us multiple times not to worry. It's not saying don't, don't think about tomorrow, don't make plans. In fact, Jesus in the same chapter, um, in the model prayer, uh, he said, give us this day our daily bread. It's okay to think and pray about things for today. And then he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. It's okay to pray about things that happened yesterday. Forgive us our debts. And then he says, lead us not into temptation. Pray about tomorrow. It's okay to have a plan for today, for yesterday, and tomorrow, and to pray about these things. That's fine. That's not what Jesus is saying. But don't allow these things to choke you out spiritually. And that's exactly what worry does, is it suffocates us. Um, and that's not who we're called to be as Christians. Uh, we're called to have a living hope. Uh, the parable of the sower that Jesus told, Matthew chapter 18 and we'll close with this. Matthew chapter 18. Uh, Jesus tells us the parable of the sower. You guys are all familiar with this. A sower goes out and sows seed. He's casting seed. Uh, some falls on good ground and bears a good crop. Some falls on stony ground. It grows instantly, but then it dies because it doesn't have root. Some seed goes among thorns, and it grows, and then it's choked out. Uh, well, in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 18, Jesus explains this parable to us. He says this, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who receives the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now this is what I want to draw our attention to, verse 22. Now he who received among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Did you hear what the thorns represented? It represents the cares and the concerns of this world. And what did the thorns do? They choked out the word. And that's exactly what the enemy would have us do, especially in these circumstances that we're living in. To allow the cares of this world to choke out the promises that are clearly given to us in God's word. To allow the cares and the stresses of this life to literally suffocate God's word. And, and again, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Be ready to give a reason of the hope. This world needs to see the hope that we have. And the hope is in us. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 says, apart from Christ, we're hopeless. Is there hopelessness in this world? Absolutely. Are there things that non-Christians should be worried about in this world? Absolutely. But we stand in contrast to them. Death, darkness, contrasted with light and life. Hope and faith, contrasted with fear and worrying. Jesus has called us to have hope. In fact, he is our living hope. And he's called us to have faith. Without it, it's impossible to please him. And so are you allowing the cares of this life to choke out, to suffocate God's promises? 
you have to ask yourself that question, and, and if it is true, then the solution's pretty simple. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Make him, put him on the throne. Seek his kingdom, not your own. And, and he'll take care of the rest. All these things will be added unto you. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, thank you for the reminder that you are our living hope. Lord, that all the things in this life that we're tempted to worry about, Father, you've dealt with it all. The promises of your word, Lord, are how we endure. Putting you on the throne are how we get through. Lord, you told us that tribulation would come. Lord, you told us that things would fall apart in this life. Lord, we live in a fallen planet, but we look to your word. We trust in your promises. Or we're reminded tonight, Father, that you overcame. And Lord, that same power, Father, that you displayed in rising again from the dead, Lord, lives in us. And Father, I pray that you would give us victory over the things that we worry about. Father, help us not to get so caught up in uh, the circumstances in this world, Father, that we forget to look into the truth of your word. Lord, I pray for all my brothers and sisters, Lord, who, um, Father, are at home with their families. Pray that you would bless them, provide for them. Lord, help us to practice our faith, Lord. I pray that you would give us opportunities to tell people, to share with people about the hope that we have. Father, I pray that they would approach us, that that hope would be um, lived out in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.